This week on the show, Super Bowl therapy after the Patriots lost to the Eagles Sunday night. We look at the brighter side of Boston sports with the Bruins and Celtics. All that and more, calling it, starts right now. All right. How you doing? I've been better. I'm not, you know, I'm not clinically depressed, but I'm not happy. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to be today. This is the Call It Podcast powered by CLNS. I'm Alex Barth. He's Alex Lebowitz. Patriots losing the Super Bowl Sunday night. Was it 41-33? I don't even want to think yeah. about it. Um, but we'll talk about it here for a little bit. We'll get into some other Boston sports stuff too after. Uh, but... I mean, there's only one place you can start, and that's with Malcolm Butler. What the hell happened? I I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out a logical reason as to why he didn't play one defensive snap, and I can't. Did he miss the team playing? I heard Charlie Weiss talking about that last night on, on the NBC Sports Boston post game. Did he get in a fight? I, I don't know. All I know is that there, there probably is no logical reason to sit – one of your best, arguably your best cornerback for the entire game when you lost by one score, and he probably could have helped you avoid giving up some of those touchdowns. I'll say this. Even if he's in, you know, and, and the coaching was piss poor all night, Eric Rowe and Alshon Jeffrey to start the game was wrong. We all knew that. We said all week it should be Stephon Gilmore, and once they switched Stephon Gilmore on to him, Jeffrey essentially went away. And maybe the game plan, Malcolm Butler not, was to put Eric Rowe on Alshon Jeffrey, but... From what players said, they didn't expect Malcolm Butler not to play. So you were throwing this at them very late. The players weren't ready because of this. And maybe if Butler's in the game from the start, then then Gilmore is on Alshon Jeffrey. And you can take away that early touchdown in the back of the end zone and the other touchdown he set up with a long ball. It's not also it's not just what punishment was so severe that he didn't play. What punishment was so severe that he didn't play, but not severe enough that he dressed? Like Belichick gives himself plausible deniability. If Belichick's not dressed, he doesn't have the option. But Butler was right there. He played a snap on special teams. What, what the hell are you trying to prove, Bill? I, I, I had a, a history teacher in high school who always used this line. I think it's one of the, the most true sentiments about human nature. You will always be remembered for your last worst act. And if that is indeed Belichick's last act, or one of them, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. I mean, he's still the greatest coach of all time. But boy, is this going to be the first thing that gets brought up when you hear his name. Do you think that there's any chance that Malcolm Butler not dressing had nothing to do with disciplinary reasons? Yes, and that actually leads me to my next point. So flashback to 2010, uh, the divisional game against the Jets, right? And that was the year Danny Woodhead broke out. Danny Woodhead, the former Jet, he'd gotten cut from the Jets. It was on hard knocks. It was all blown up. Belichick signs him. Woodhead has an amazing season. And Belichick went into that game, and we could tell, despite how good the Jets' defense was, specifically against the run and stopping running backs, Bill Belichick didn't just want to beat the Jets. He wanted to beat the Jets with Danny Woodhead to rub it in. All right, you remember this game? Yeah. And it became clear, I think, like halfway through the first quarter that wasn't going to work. And it didn't matter. Belichick stuck with it for four quarters, and they got blown out, and Danny Woodhead did nothing. Now remember back to the beginning of this season. The Patriots could have traded Malcolm Butler for Brandon Cooks, and they traded the first-round pick instead. And Belichick's been getting criticized all year for that move and not having the first-round pick, and Butler was going to be gone anyway. Why didn't you trade him? And I'm left wondering, what if this was Belichick trying to shut all those people up and saying, I can win this game without Malcolm Butler. I made the right trade. And him trying to prove the point. What if this was Danny Woodhead 2010 all over again? Especially after they lost Cooks, which killed them. I think that was a huge, Cooks was a huge part of the offensive game plan. I think losing him killed them. There were some reasons they lost that were just outside of their control. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. But yes, I think some of this had to do with Belichick wanting to silence the criticism that he made the wrong decision not trading Malcolm Butler in the offseason. I think he's been going at it with Butler all year. I think he lost the locker room more than we know. If you saw the Brandon Browner post this morning, talking about how the locker room was torn apart. I think he lost the... Forget his relationship with Brady. I I think this is another Adelius Thomas situation. I think he lost the locker room a long time ago. And we just didn't know it because they were winning. But that was not a team last night that that looked together. 
And the players did. The players were fine. But but there was a major disconnect between the players and the coaches. And I don't remember ever seeing anything like that from the Patriots. That's the kind of crap that other teams do that lets the Patriots pull off these miraculous wins. And we saw the other side of the coin last night. And it wasn't pretty. The Patriots, and, and I, I know you're willing to get at the bit, but I, I just want to say this. What we saw from the Patriots last night, and it, it really feels like this is the end this morning. Whether Belichick leaves, whether Brady leaves, this feels like the end, right? If, if this is the end, and I think what we saw last night was the Patriots becoming the 32nd NFL team in that it's always been the Patriots and everybody else. I hate to break it to, to I hate to break it to myself. I hate to break it to everybody else too. The Patriots are everybody else this morning. Wake up, get ready. It's a new era. We're right there in the pack. I think, you know, after the press conference, and obviously we'll get in, more into this in the next segment, you have Rob Gronkowski openly contemplating retirement. You have both your coordinators leaving, although Josh McDaniel seems like he might be staying, which might be a sign that something else is going to happen. Again, we'll get to that later. Uh, you have Patricia out the door. You have Brady, who's probably more angry than anyone because he had the game of his life, although he did give up that fourth quarter fumble. It, it seems like there there are problems. I don't think I'd go as far as you did saying that the locker room is divided and all that. But going back to the Malcolm Butler decision, there's no logical explanation for sitting him the entire game. None whatsoever. And one thing I will never understand is Bill Belichick's treatment of Malcolm Butler throughout his career. The guy won him a Super Bowl back in 2014 or 2015 against the Seahawks. And I know that that was a while ago. That was three years ago. But he's played at a, at a Pro Bowl level since then. And this season, he was one of your two best cornerbacks on your team. Arguably the best. And you sit him the entire game. It, it seems like it's a move made out of stubbornness and, and not logic. And that is why this might be one of the bigger stains on Belichick's career. Oh, the biggest. I think it's the biggest. I don't think it's a question. It's the biggest. What else is there? I mean, people will point to Spygate. And that's, di- that's different. That's different. This is a, a bad football decision. Yes. And yeah. if you want to talk about his treatment of Malcolm Butler, go back to this summer. This is a guy who came in from day one, did everything the Patriot way. Everything you everything the, the way you ask guys to do it. And he couldn't get a contract. He couldn't get a second contract. He wanted to come back and Belichick lowballed him. There aren't a lot of guys. Look, Belichick lowballs most players, and that's fine. And I get it. And that's part of who he is. But generally, the guys who come in and do exactly what they're told and play at a high level, they get some leniency. Belichick didn't give it to him. He tagged him. Mm-hmm. And I, I, there has to be a lot of blame on Bill Belichick. So, so let me ask you this. You you heard Gronk's comments after the game. Yeah. Um, we've heard all the rumors surrounding the coaching staff, whether it's Belichick or McDaniels or Patricia. How much worse does the Garoppolo trade look this morning? Uh, I I think I I don't know. I don't know because I I, I oddly enough I don't think they're related. You don't think they're related at all. So you because because here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that you're talking about the window closing shut, and you're talking about you know potentially this team being completely divided and maybe some irreversible damage is done. I know it's the day after the Super Bowl, but we have to get into this. Brady, that could be the last time Brady makes it to the Super Bowl. Right, but Brady looked... I mean, if you want to talk about the Garoppolo trade, the thing about the Garoppolo trade for me, we can't properly analyze it for another three or four years because there's just so much we don't know. First of all, Brady looked great last night. He looked amazing. He's still 40. Right, but he looked like he was 25. So in terms of needing another quarterback, I'm comfortable with Tom Brady next year, regardless of who the head coach is. And let's say that this is it for Belichick. What if McDaniels told him Garoppolo's not the guy? What if McDaniels said, look, when I take over, I I don't want him as my quarterback. I want to get my own guy. Then it it makes perfect sense Mm -hmm. because otherwise they would have gotten nothing for him. Would Garoppolo have helped them last night? No. To what I thought was, if you're going to make a deal at the deadline, maybe the deal should have been Malcolm Butler. I don't think the Garoppolo trade itself is redefined in any way last night. But I think if they were going to make a move at the deadline, maybe they moved the wrong guy. Unless Butler had, had an okay standing at that point. There's just so much we don't know. I, I don't think this doesn't redefine that trade for me in any way because there's still so many uncertainties. If he wasn't McDaniel's guy, he wasn't McDaniel's guy. 
I, I'm just saying, if, if the window really is shut, if this if this is a, is the end for the Patriots and this 18 year long yeah. dynasty, it does look bad. It looks horrible. Because, you knew it wasn't going to end pretty, though. Yeah, but I didn't think it would end this fast. When when you have a team that's the number one team in the AFC, they make it to the Super Bowl. Brady's the MVP, uh, and you still have your coaching staff intact and Gronk. Most importantly, who is now again contemplating right. retirement. It looks a lot better than the day after the Super Bowl, Gronk might retire. Uh, Belichick might be questioning his future. You have your coordinators out the door, maybe not McDaniels, but still Patricia. And Brady's going to be a year older. I think I think this morning uh, that Garoppolo trade does look a lot worse, given where everyone on the uh, – every important member of this team stands. Look, I'll say this before we move on to, to what's next. And, and there are other elements about the game we could talk about. I want to say the Eagles – were fantastic last amazing, night. Yeah. Doug Peterson was outstanding. The call to go for it on fourth and one was mm-hmm. great. Um, I, 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 I thought he was fantastic last night. The offensive night. line was The offensive superb. line. The Patriots kept getting almost there. The offensive line yeah. knew exactly how much time. To, that was a team that was ready. That was a team that was prepared, that was confident. LeGarrette Blunt was LeGarrette good, too. Blunt killed them last night. Um, but, but look, I'll say this. If this is it, and I'm not saying that I think it's over. I'm just saying, it, like, gut feeling. And it's easy to say that the day after loss. Gut feeling. It, it feels like it's over. You know, it, it feels like things are moving on, but um, you can't ask for anything more. And as bad as Belichick looked last night, um, he's still the greatest coach of all time. He still gave us five Super Bowls. And real quick, because we got to wrap this segment up, but real quick, the, the one other thing I think I realized last night, and the way Brady played, and why I don't think it hit me so hard right away when they lost, and I think a lot of New Englanders, I want every Patriots fan, Patriots fan in quotes, because you're going to see where I'm going with this sec, every Patriots fan to ask themselves this question right now and honestly think about it. Are you a New England Patriots fan? I mean, look, I am a Patriots fan. I root for the Patriots. But primarily, if you had to pick one to defi- define yourself, are you a New England Patriots fan or are you a Tom Brady fan? Because I think I'm a Tom Brady fan more than I'm a New England Patriots fan. I'm definitely a Tom Brady fan more than I'm a Bill Belichick fan. And Interesting. Okay, I, I think that's where you have to go with that because obviously you're going to be a Patriots fan when Tom Brady is all said and done. Whose legacy are you going to look at more fondly, though? Are you going to look at Tom Brady's well, legacy after last night? Exactly. So uh, I, I think, I think a lot of the feeling that New England Patriots fans have is anger towards Belichick, not because he he screwed you out of winning. He screwed Tom Brady out yeah. of winning. I think that's that's the main crux of it. And I, I think you know through Deflategate through all the comebacks, through everything. I think it's just, look, if Brady went elsewhere and he played the Patriots in a championship, <laughs> I I don't know. I honestly, like, thinking about it, I honestly don't know. Yeah, it's tough. It really is. But, um, look, there, it may be over, maybe not. There's a lot that's going to happen in the next week or two. Some has already happened. I don't think the offseason's gotten off on the right foot. Uh, we'll talk about that on the other side. You're listening to Calling It, powered by CLNS. Calling It is brought to you by American Broadcast Coaches, training the next generation of media talent and communicators. For more information, check out AmericanBroadcastCoaches.com. All right, welcome back to Calling It. The question now going forward. What happens with Bill Belichick? And after the way that game ended last night, the reactions from some former players, from some current players, I I don't know how he goes back in that locker room next year. I don't know how he can go in because Malcolm Butler did everything Bill Belichick asked of him, and he couldn't get on the field in the biggest game of the year. And I, I just don't, I, even even with Bill Belichick's legacy, and I think part of this is a generational thing, I think the mentality of players 10, 15 years ago is a lot different than it is now. But if you see that as a player, I don't know how you can go in and take that guy seriously. I th- I think it's the coldest move he's ever made. Cutting a guy is one thing. That's one like it, getting rid of cut, parting ways with guys like Matt Light. That's one thing. It's creating guys like Logan Mankins. Okay. But if you have a guy on your team who plays the majority of the snaps every regular season and playoff game leading up to the Super Bowl, then you sit him in the Super Bowl, that's cold. That is so cold. And and that's something that pisses off 
all your players. You know, I was just watching the Brandon Browner yep. video, and he's saying if you find that out right before the game that this guy isn't playing, that's a distraction. Mr. No Distractions, Bill Belichick, maybe created one of the biggest distractions we've seen well, from, it was from clear. Patriots. Team. They didn't know the coverages early on. People were out of assignment because they yeah. were expecting to have Malcolm on the field. I Look, I, I, before I saw the two Bills, which was great, by the way. It was amazing. I was 100% convinced Belichick was going to be back, and it was all noise, and it was all nonsense. And then I saw the part where Parcells got into it with Kraft about personnel decisions. And it became very clear to me a couple of things watching that and just everything that's happened in the last couple of weeks. I think Belichick takes Parcells' words as law. I think he looks up to Parcells and wants to be Parcells more than we realize. And I think he's starting to get to the point in his relationship with Kraft that Parcells did when it all went south. Seeing that documentary and then given what happened last night, I am I'm I actually my cousin just texted me and said his retirement on the table for Belichick. What are the odds? Fifty fifty. You think it's fifty fifty? I think it's fifty fifty. I I would not be shocked if he if he resigns today or tomorrow. If he does, he's not doing it today or tomorrow. You, you got to think. He realizes that would be an emotional decision. He's going to do it soon. He's not going to hang around. You think? Yeah. Why would he hang around? I don't know. I I think the end is relatively near. I don't think he's retiring this year. I think he'll be back next year. I don't think he's retiring. I think he's resigning. So he finishes career his career on another team. I, I think he's he's gonna just, he'll step away from the game and then and then maybe come back. I don't think he's gonna say he's done with coaching. I think he'll just say I'm stepping away from the game for a year to to reevaluate. He needs to. After that decision last night, he really needs to look because I can't he's, again. He's the greatest coach of all time, first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah. Nobody's close. But even the greats, you know, the we we talk about how much the game has changed in his era, and you saw it even more so going back and watching that documentary and even back to when he was a Giants, right? The game has completely changed. And he adapted through a lot of it. He was a part of a lot of those changes. He was the reason for a lot of those exactly. changes. Exactly. He is the change. But is it possible that the in in the age of social media and and just just a different attitude players have towards the game and again, just the millennial attitude, is it possible the NFL has passed Bill Belichick by? Is it at all possible? I don't think that's the case. I I think he has some players on that team who are definitely looking at him in a different life, light and, and, and saying, oh, that's how it is. Okay. And I think they knew it all along, but doing something like, like what he did with Malcolm Butler yesterday definitely turned some heads. I don't think he completely lost the locker room. I think you come back next year, you start winning. People will forget if you start winning. I don't know if he's going to start winning. You, so you think this is something that will carry over into next year and plague the Patriots – uh, throughout the course of next season. So that, that leads me into the next point of discussion here. And that is what what personnel changes are they going to make? And they have to replace some big names here. Danny Amendola is a free agent. I would assume he'll be back. Malcolm Butler, I think, gone, right? <laughs> I, I mean... <laughs> imagine if he came I, I, I can't imagine he goes back to, to, the, to the building. I think he hires somebody to clean out his locker for yes. him. Um, let's put it this way. Butler's back. Belichick's definitely gone. Butler will not play for Belichick again. Yeah, I don't. I don't uh, yeah, right. like I think he's, he's gone regardless. But maybe, maybe, maybe if if there's another coach, maybe he's like, you know what, Bill. What anyway? Butler gone. Solder's gone. Solder, I think, is retiring. Which you know, good for him. Retiring or one year he, deal. He tops. he he's had a lot going on in his life off the field, and I think although I, he's wanted to step away. I had a chance to speak with him when I was in Minnesota, you did? Okay. and he said he wants to be back with the Patriots. All right, so he could be back, but um, Burkhead, free agent. Dion Lewis, a free agent. Um, they got some names to replace, right? Uh, James Harrison, who as bad as he was in the Super Bowl, was kind of key down the stretch there. Yeah. You didn't need another edge guy. They got to do something to middle linebacker. You know what Hightower's health situation is. How is Belichick? And again, this go, kind of goes to, to the day and age. Ten years ago, right? Belichick would have fed us some company line about why Malcolm Butler was benched. That's that's what it is. We move on. Now with Twitter and, and the increased press level, there's another side of the story. And players that need to resign, free agents, how many of them are going to see that and say, I don't want to play for this guy? I know I know what his history is, but the NFL is a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately league. And what has Bill Belichick done lately? He made a horrible decision, 
and pissed off a very important player. I I think this is really going to hurt them this off season. I it could. Who who's available? Uh, I don't know if they're going to bring bring in any big name free agents. Regardless, I think they're going to rebuild a lot through the draft. Well, even just re-signing guys, bringing guys back. The guys who are in the room who saw that may not want to be back. Amendola is going to going to be back. He'll be back, yeah. Um, but a guy like Dion Lewis, does a guy like Dion Lewis see that and say, you know what, I could be next? I mean, what's the alternative though? Because the Patriots are still probably going to be one of the favorites. And where she, I don't know. I don't think that one singular thing is going to uh, deter people from signing, re-signing with the Patriots. I think it'd be a culmination of anything because these guys have their own interactions with Belichick. They know him on a completely different level, and I don't think one action is going to define what type of relationship. But do, they do have you with. do you buy the divided locker room after think, seeing think, that Brandon Brown or Post and some other things? I think there are a lot of players who are pissed off. Yeah, but they you can be pissed off and still want to be a Patriot. I, I think I don't know. I you to play and and we've heard players say it. If you want to play for Bill Belichick, you have to really want to play for Bill Belichick. You can't go in there just kind of, you know what, I'll deal with Belichick and, and it's a good place to win. You have to be 100% buy-in. And if if guys aren't 100% buy-in, in, I don't think they want to be there. I don't think you can tolerate Bill Belichick. I think you have to accept all of who he is in order to play on the Patriots. I don't think you can just tolerate him. So going forward now, how how many guys are, are going to accept what he did last night? He cost these guys, a lot of people in that locker room, something they've been working their whole lives for I don't know how you can just kind of shake that off and say whatever is is the word apology in Belichick's vocabulary nope, nope. not not he, he won't he won't apologize to the players he might give something out to the media like and I think he said today like I made a bad decision that one's on me we might get that line from him but he won't apologize to him I don't think so I think if he does that that will that will repair restore some relationships and at least they're like, okay, he admitted that he was wrong. We can move on. I'm not saying he's going to do that. I think that's one way that he repairs these relationships. And if he realizes that he's lost the locker room and he's like, this is the most efficient way to move forward, forward, even even if he doesn't believe the apology, he might do it anyway. Who who knows? I, I What's I, more likely, Bill Belichick apologizing or Bill Belichick resigning? I think an apology is more likely. I think he's staying around. I, I can't see him retiring after this season, especially going out on that note. I just can't. I'm still fifty fifty, man. I could I, I understand that. I I just don't I don't know. I don't think he's gonna retire. I think he's coming back next year. I don't think one move is gonna define uh his relationship with players. And I think th- at the end of the day, they won't completely get over it, but it's something that they will move past and still be a legit contender in the AFC next season. Look, I just think you saw how Seattle collapsed after, right? We, we've heard for two years now the stories of what a nightmare that locker room is. All going back to Pete Carroll's decision to throw the ball in Super Bowl Forty Nine. The Falcons, I mean, they got back to the playoffs, but they clearly had some issues this year between the players and Dan Quinn. Right? Like I said in the last segment, the Patriots are where the other 31 teams are. But If this was any of the other 31 teams, no-brainer, locker room's torn apart. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's 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 it. Bill Belichick runs a tighter ship than Pete Carroll and Dan Quinn. Pete Carroll's a, people can walk o- all over Pete Carroll. He's kind of a stiff. Dan Quinn, good coach, great defensive mind. He's not the best runner or leader of a locker room. Belichick is a guy who has run the most disciplined team, who has who has had the most disciplined team throughout his tenure in the NFL. They'll get past this. That's going to happen. I my whole thing is is the window slamming shut. Is Grock going to retire? If Grock retires, then they could be screwed. And and you mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, there's not much to talk about. Like you said, he, he leaves. You're in big trouble. You can't you can't replace him. You can't even try to replace him. I no. mean, it's that that that's an all time great player. Um, look, do I do I want him to retire? I'd love to watch him keep playing, but you know that's a guy that's got a very successful career ahead of him in entertainment or whatever he wants to get into. And I would hope that he makes the right decision. If he retires, I won't blame him, is kind of where I'm going with this. I would retire if I was wrong. Yeah, I, I would absolutely retire, and well, I will say, I don't that unlike the Belichick thing, that decision I don't think comes right away. That, I think, comes closer to training camp. Um, but, you know, they take a tight end in the first two rounds of the draft, we know something's up. Um, I, I think they're, I mean, they're going to go after, I think he'll make a decision before the draft 
But and if they do, yeah, they'll probably go after a tight end, and then you're going to see them go after a quarterback and and a linebacker probably. The one other thing I want to bring up: uh, off season already underway. New defensive coordinator replaced Matt Patricia. Will be Greg Schiano. When, when did that come out? Who who's it came out this that? morning? Um, let me let me find the report. Hang on, I have it on Twitter. So if it's Greg Schiano, this is the guy who Belichick's obviously had a lot of love for. Right. That that kind of I guess helps with the Belichick coming back. So I have. Uh, Zach Barnett, yeah, I see of that. Football scoop. Ryan Hannibal also. Ryan Hannibal has. All right, so I mean, I you know it's believable, but that's that's the wrong decision. You think? And yeah, hundred percent should be Brian Flores. Hundred percent. The dude's brilliant. Shiano has had very little success in the NFL. He had little success at, at Rutgers. He, no, he did a good job at Rutgers. I think mm. he turned that that program around. I think it sh- I think it should have been Flores. I, I that's the wrong hire to me. Because now you're going to lose Flores. And Flores really should be the next head coach of this team, not McDaniels. You, really? Look what McDaniels did in Denver. Do you trust that guy? Yeah, but that was a first-time stint, and Belichick wasn't that successful, and he was with the Browns the first uh, time. I, I don't know. I I think they already got off. And, and, look, maybe I'm just being pessimistic the day after the Super Bowl, but people who know me, I rarely, rarely, even if I think it's the wrong move, I rarely criticize Patriots offseason moves because in Bill we trust. And... I'm I'm not going to say that that I don't trust him anymore but that was just egregious last night. He's got to earn it back. That was bad. that was egregious. Um you want to try to cheer up a little bit? Yeah. You catch the Celtics game yesterday? Yeah, I did a little bit. All right, we'll talk about that on the other side. This is Calm It powered by CLNS. Calling It is brought to you by American Broadcast Coaches, training the next generation of media talent and communicators. For more information, check out AmericanBroadcastCoaches.com. Well, it is Boston. The competitive drum marches on. And... Let's start here. Last two times Celtics won a championship, Patriots lost Super Bowl that year. So, I don't know. If you saw them last night, uh, it's not the Celtics by any means that we'll see in the playoffs. They're missing Smart. They're missing Kyrie. They're missing... Who else wasn't playing? Morris didn't play, I think, last night. Yesterday was a noon game. Um, They've been pretty banged up the last couple of games. But they've won four in a row after losing five of six out of the All-Star break. They've got their legs back under them. Um... And this team seems legit. This team, look, I, I think they've gone through their lowest low. They they struggled between the All-Star break and going to Europe. I think that threw them off a little bit. But uh, I think their best basketball is still ahead of them, level it's. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're starting to gel. And it's tough to, to keep consistency and, and, and continue to, to grow uh, chemistry-wise when you got so many guys going out. But that's the NBA season for you. Uh one thing is you can always count on a Brad Stevens led team to to really pick it up. And right now they have a, a pretty steady lead in the East. Two games up on Toronto. And then seven and a half on Cleveland, which that's a dumpster fire. And that's Cleveland's third, so that's that's yeah. the gap, right? Yeah. yeah. Um but yeah, they're playing great basketball. And you have a guy in Terry Rozier who's really starting to push Marcus Smart out of the out of the picture in regard to the Celtics future. Uh this was the most important stretch for him in his Celtics career, because th- this was when you really yeah. figured out what what is he made of? Can he be the guy? Can he be that sixth man for you? And he's been playing like a star. He had a triple double. He dropped thirty points. Uh, he hit an awesome. It wasn't the game winner, but I think it was the game tire against uh, Atlanta. That fade away yeah. should have been fouled. Yeah, it was an awesome shot. But he's been remarkable. Uh, and when you have guys like that stepping up. And then, obviously, the young guys, Tatum and Brown, contributing. It's awesome to see. Because you know you have Kyrie, who's banged up. He needs to come back. Gordon Hayward, who I'm guessing is ahead of schedule. I think he'll be back before the end of the season. The future's bright for the Celtics. And this season, you can talk about, legitimately, they are the Eastern Conference favorites. Not the one seed. They are the favorites to come right. out of the no, Eastern they, Conference. They, they, should, they should be in the finals. They should be playing in June. Well, then there's a big difference between those when you're talking about the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I'm not saying they'll beat the Warriors, but push them to five, six games, maybe. Uh, and that's all you need with a team like this. You just need a team that's going to continue to grow and play at an elite level. And right now they're doing that. So that leads me to my next point. And the NBA trade deadline is this week. It's Thursday. Um, 
And of course, follow us on Twitter at Calling It Podcast. We'll have more trade deadline updates for you as we go. Um, and you mentioned Terry Rozier possibly pushing Marcus Smart out. Now, Marcus Smart's uh, on the uh, injury list. He punched a picture, whatever. You know, we all get upset. Um, if you and they're, they're both their contracts up at the the end of the year, and the feeling is you can only keep one. Who are you keeping right now between those two? Between Marcus Smart and Terry yeah. Rozier. Uh, I'm, I'm keeping Rozier because his contract. I think he's going to ask for less money than Smart. Is he the, the given the way he's been playing? I think so because you got to look at the body of work. Who's been the better player in the last two years, three years? And it's definitely Marcus Smart. It, it's just Rozier start, starting to take that jump. And I want the guy who's more consistent offensively. I, I don't want because the reason we should go back. The reason Marcus Smart punched a, 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 a mirror or whatever it was, a, a picture. It's because he took the last shot in that in that game. I thought it was because an Instagram model stopped banging him. Was that what it was? Something like that, yeah. Okay, I thought I went back to, to when... No, 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 it had to do with an Instagram model. Again, oh, again. Which is worse. <laughs> di- different time. It did, like I talked about with the Belichick stuff. Different time. Millennials are ruining ruining sports. Thank God Brad Stevens is more understanding. Um, but No, I, I was going to say, <laughs> Stevens looks up to Belichick. If they get to the finals, will he bench Jalen Brown in Game 7? I doubt it. I don't think he's as spiteful. Um but I would say I, it's tough because when you look at this, this Celtics team, they're going to have a lot of elite scores. They're going to have you know Jason Tatum, Kyrie Irving, and Gordon Hayward, who will get the job done offensively. Yeah. Terry Rozier is not as good defensively as Marcus Smart, so it's about who fills that void. It's probably Marcus Smart. It is. I just think he's going to ask for a lot more money, and when you have so many guys who are up and coming and are going to want big money in a few years, you have to weigh that in. So uh, I think Terry Rozier, simply from a business standpoint, it makes more sense, and you're still going to be better with him. So the ca- I, I'm I'm on. I want them to keep Marcus Smart, okay? Because you can get guys like Terry Rozier. You can get guys who can fill up the score sheet off the bench. Remember, Terry Rozier is not a starter. If he's starting, something's wrong because it should be Kyrie Irving and Rozier needs. 30, 35 minutes a game to put up those numbers. He was like 5 of 17 from the field yesterday. Yeah. Something like that. It wasn't a pretty number. Marcus, What Marcus Smart does defensively, I don't know if there's anybody in the league who can do defensively what Marcus Smart does. Look back at the the Rockets game, right? Those two fouls he drew on James Harden late. Uh, Steph Curry had 48 points combined against the Celtics in the previous two meetings. He had 49 the game Marcus Smart missed. I think if you're going to see the Warriors in the finals, even say two times in the next four years, which honestly seems realistic at this point. Don't you want Marcus Smart to take away Steph Curry? Don't you want to build for those series with the Warriors? I I I think Marcus Smart is such a unique player. You take the bad offense, given what he does defensively, because they have so many other scores. I just can't understand why he keeps taking these shots, because he's just really negatively affecting his value when he's taking the last shot in games where you have, where the other four guys on the court are better shooters than you. Like I, I just I think he shoots himself in the foot constantly, and and you do make a really good point. If you're going up against the Golden State Warriors, obviously having a guy like Marcus Smart's more more valuable than having a guy like Terry Rozier, because it's about taking away their best options. Right. So I I agree with you on that point. He's still a liability offensively. Oh, he absolutely is, but it's worth it to me for the defense. And he's still going to want a lot of money. I just don't know logistically if it's going to work out. I don't know if they're going to be able to keep him on that team when, again, you have so many guys that you're going to have to pay up in a few years. The NBA cap's a joke. That's true. And and the other thing is, so you sign to a four-year deal, right? 25 to 29 is generally a pretty good age range. In worst case scenario, that becomes a very valuable expiring contract. You trade to a bad team in the last year. And that last year is the year you would need to sign Tatum. So you, in theory, could get the contract off the books before you have to pay Jason Tatum. Okay. So that, that's a pretty that's pretty complex, though. I and, and I know the report right now is that Danny Ainge is shopping Marcus Smart for first-round pick. And look, I, I think I've totally flipped on Danny Ainge and Bill Belichick in the last 24 hours. <laughs> like, I feel so dumb second-guessing Danny Ainge, but... An interesting point I heard yesterday, and Danny Ainge has been known to do this. He'll shop one player, and then at the last second, what he does is he might be saying, hey, Marcus Smart for first, Marcus Smart for first. Somebody comes with him for an offer he, with an offer he likes. You know what? I decided to keep Marcus Smart, but what about Terry Rozier? Same deal, but Terry Rozier instead of Marcus Smart. And maybe uh-huh. maybe that's what he's doing. I don't He'll know. Switch switcheroo. Yeah, I'd like to see them keep Marcus Smart. I think if you're going to be playing the Warriors, you need that defense, but um, you know, we'll see. Ultimately, though, very, very encouraging looks from the Celtics. 
And the Boston Bruins, real quick before we close the show, because we never end up talking Bruins, and they may be the, best the hottest team. team in hockey right now. I mean, they're second. The best in, team in Boston. <laughs> they might, no, they very well might be. They're the second team in the uh, Eastern Conference. They're five points behind the Tampa Bay Lightning, five ahead of a, there's a couple teams at 65 points. Meanwhile, they have a bunch of games in hand on the uh, on the Lightning. Um, they went, was it 18 games without a regulation loss? That streak just broke, but still an incredible streak. Tuka Rask, as, as up and down as he is, is through the roof right now. The young kids are awesome. Charlie McAvoy came back from heart surgery in two weeks. I I mean, I think we're, we're in for some matinees in, in April and May. We are in, in for this, this Bruins team. I'm, I think I'm more excited, honestly, about the Bruins than the Celtics just because the Bruins are so unexpected. And I think they have a better shot at winning this year than the Celtics at this point. Is, just that, give, is that a Warriors thing or is that a Celtics thing for you? That's a Warriors. It's all. It's also a sport thing. Hockey, it's easier to okay. make that upset than, than basketball because guess what? They're not beating the Warriors this year because bas- there's five guys on the court and they just – they're outmatched, and basketball is not a game where you can feasibly do that in a seven-game series. Hockey, eight seeds can can beat one seeds. It happens. It happened last year with the, with the Predators. So, uh, I, yeah, oh yeah, if you're asking me who's more likely to win a championship this year, the Bruins or the Celtics, it's the Bruins right now. And, and this is me in October. I was saying I, the Bruins should probably think about trading Patrice Burke. Oh no, we both were right. <laughs> so this turn has been quite quite exciting to watch. It, it you know what it reminds me a lot of the 2013 Red Sox in yeah. some ways that it they're except more young talent you more right they're, this team's more young talent than than affordable older talent but I mean there's really there, there aren't many flaws on this team they can score mm-hmm. which all the credit in the world to Bruce Cassidy because it's the same players Claude had but Bruce is just oh, letting them letting them run wild letting them do on the ice letting them run wild letting them do what they want and it's you you see kind of exactly how much of an issue closed system was last year. Mm-hmm. So all the credit in the world to him, they can score. Zidane O'Chara, you want to talk about 40-year-olds putting on a show. Zidane O'Chara has been, he's turned back the clock 10 years. He may be on the TB12 diet. Um, they, they've been great defensively. And, and once they finally got healthy, you know, again, Charlie McAvoy came back from heart surgery after two weeks. The, the part of the problem with the Bruins the last couple of years, right, we've all said, and it started with Tuka Rask, they didn't have heart. They didn't have that extra gear they needed to kick it into. <laughs> they got surgery. <laughs> they, they they got heart and then some. They got a well working heart in there. This team they they enjoy it. They're having fun. They care. This is a very you know today's truck day. So let's 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 make it a four sports oh. show, right? Red Sox spring training will be on the way in two weeks. Talk about two more opposite teams: the Bruins and the Red Sox. You got a team suppressing its young talent, trading it all away. A team that clearly doesn't care, and then you have a team. You know, right down the street, they're just showcasing that young talent, balls to the wall, enjoying every minute of it. I, I love the Bruins right now. I love the Bruins right now. They're a lot of fun to watch. And you brought up Bruce Cassidy. you got to give that guy credit. Because, again, obviously you have a lot of young guys who are stepping up. Heinen, McAvoy, although he's great last year, too. Um, DeBrusque, all, all these guys. And you have guys like, again, Zidane Chara, who stepped it up this season at 40 years old. Uh, but still, Bruce Cassidy's put a system in play that has helped this team just become one of the best in the Eastern I Conference. Mean, that, that top line, Marshawn, Bergeron, Pasternak, all 20, 20, is it 20 goal or 20 point guys on that top line? Yeah. And it's the same guy, again, it's the same guys Claude has. Even, you know, you want to talk about young guys, Pasternak's been around, but he's still a young guy, and we've seen his game step up to that next level this year. That and he he couldn't hit that next level under Claude because of the way they played. So, yeah, I I you know what? It's nice because once we're down to just Red Sox, this show is going to get weird this summer. <laughs> between what's going to be a, a pulling teeth Patriots off season and just a miserable Red Sox season, this show is going to get 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 ready for a lot of blank or firework. I guess is what I'm going to say. <laughs> type segments Take this summer. Take Jeopardy this summer. A lot but of national storylines. I I do feel like we're gonna. You know, it's going to get XFL takes. We need to talk oh, about yeah. that. We'll get into that again. We'll have plenty of time this summer for that. But um, I think the Celtics and Bruins are going to buy us some time getting to that. And I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I hope so. Feel a little better now? A little bit? A little bit better. This is like therapy for me. It, it, you know what? It does, there, there still may be a parade yet in 2018. It's not going to be the Red Sox. But no. there still may be a parade yet 
in 2018. Of course, we'll have it all for you. Uh, we'll talk about the trading deadline next week, some more Patriots thoughts, um, and I guess truck day next week, spring training. Yeah, Pitchers and catchers, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, report next week. If if one more effing person tells me it's okay because of truck day, and now I'm upset again. <laughs> Bruins are in second place. But they drive a truck Bruins from Boston to Florida. It's crazy. It has all the oh, stuff in it. Oh, <laughs> baseball's on the highway. There's stuff in that truck that they oh, drive boy. down. It's, Do you know the truck has its own Twitter account? Ugh. So does so is Wally. If you're a mascot, you don't get it because it's just some random person inside of you. That used to be my, my uh, cross street neighbor growing up was Wally. Really? I thought I was the coolest kid in school because my sixth birthday party, Wally came. That's pretty. She cool. had the costume. It was pretty. It wasn't cool. like a fake one either. It was the real. No, it Wally. was the real. And I told people I knew Wally. Wally lived across the street from me. And like I had a teacher be like, "That's not how it works." I was like, "No, it's true." And you know, I would hate that job. That's what well, that would be the worst job. It's in the world. it's a couple people. It, oh, I know. That's what it was. It I'm just saying it's, yeah. it's it's hot in that uniform. You gotta like dance. Yeah. And, oh, you gotta be enthusiastic about the Red Sox. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it's it's a lot of faking. All right, now I feel better again. All right. Um, so, yeah, so we got a lot of good stuff coming for you next week. NHL trade deadline, I think, too, although I don't expect the Bruins to be too active. Who knows? We'll see. Greg Monroe, we didn't even talk about Oh, we didn't. Monroe. So, okay, let's close on this. I'm going to ask you this. Uh, Greg Monroe signed with Celtics. Do they make another move at the deadline? Smart, Rozier, regardless. I don't think so. I, they're sho- I, they're, obviously, the reports are they're, they're shopping smart. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't, I don't know what they expect to get, though, and I, I think they're better off just keeping smart to the end of the season. I think if you can get a guy like Tyreek Evans for yeah. even the Celtics' own first, right, I'm fine giving that pickup. That's going to be in, in the low 20s at least. Yeah. Um, si- even signing Tony Allen, who just got waived, especially if you're going to trade Marcus Smart, signing Tony Allen, bringing him in. I think there's some moves to be made, but I, I think they will make a move, but I don't think it'll be anything blockbuster. Yeah, no, nothing big. All right. Uh, unfortunately, our therapy uh, session has to end. Run a little long, but again, you can join us next week for, I think it's going to be a four-sport show next week, Patriots, Red Sox, Celtics, Bruins. Follow us on Twitter, at Calling It Podcast. You can check us out on the brand new clnsmedia.com. Follow CLNS on Twitter as well, at CLNS Media. For Alex Lebowitz, I'm Alex Barth. Thanks for listening to Calling It. We'll talk to you next week.